Hebrews chapter 10, I'm continuing on with this series, uh, just looking at grace, crucifies religion. We've had a, I just finished a book on grace, and uh, Harrison House requested that I write one, and we've been trying to come up with a name for it. Someone gave me the name uh, Grace Carved in Wood. You think about that one a little bit, huh? Wasn't that the cross of Calvary? Anybody home? Yeah. Interesting title. Well, uh, this message of grace is, it just, uh, I gave, kind of shared the word with you last week that the Lord said I was to take grace and truth to the nations or his church and that he's got this plan and it's a, it's a whole new experience for me. I'm going to be here on 8 o'clock most of the time, but uh, what a task, but he also said, I'm in training. And after 45 years of ministry, I'm trying to figure out what that meant. <laughs> but I'm in training in grace, and if I'm in training in grace, so are you. So is the church. We are growing in grace and growing in what we call revelation of grace. But with revelation of grace, I realize that we were saved by grace through faith. So we really received all of the grace that we would need. It is what provided salvation for us, the power to translate us into eternity at salvation. So it is the ultimate power of the living God that we received already. The only reason that we call it revelation of grace is, is that we have to dig up or uncover or get rid of the legalistic covering that has coated what we know as grace. It's got to get out of the soul. We've got to wash it with the water of the Word so we can get back to full understanding. And that's what we are doing is growing in grace. Y'all follow that? Because we have all been taught through the years, even before we were saved, we were taught that church and religion and all of that was about what you can't do, what you can't have, what God desires to steal from you, and that God is a wrathful God and all kinds of strange coatings that we have put over the top of the ultimate love of God called grace. And sometimes I think even through the years and we taught on the word love, it was like one of the most boring subjects you ever heard. And we heard Agape and Eros, and we've heard all kinds of different sermons concerning the love of God. But it is the ultimate power that cannot fail. I said the love of God cannot fail. Your love does. That's why there's so many divorces. But God's love can't fail, and we receive that with this thing called grace. And I've been taking you on a path to try to get us to a place where we might really uncover and continue to uncover to grasp what this grace is and how it operates and make sure that I hate the word balance because there is no balance to grace, but to understand truthfully that grace is a specific entity that teaches us to say no to ungoodness. In other words, the Holy Spirit who works with this grace, which is Christ Jesus, filled with tr truth and grace, the Holy Spirit continuously leads us to what Jesus said, and Jesus only said what the Father said, and so it will always lead us to goodness. And once we grasp the goodness of God, I think we're headed in the right direction concerning living right, living an abundant life that Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundant. And I believe that we've been searching for that abundant life for virtually years and years, even in the prosperity teaching of the church. And prosperity teaching is once again under attack. They're now attacking, uh, news media is attacking uh, Joel and, and uh, 
Osteen and all that prosperity preachers and teachers and trying to stir up the IRS and a bunch of other funny money stuff because they don't want us to teach that God's good, that God desires to bless. Amen. So it's a lot of strange things that, again, are going on out there that are attacks against the local church. But this grace message to me, and the reason we're having this conversation, is that as soon as we uh, gain revelation of grace, immediately the enemy comes to do whatever he can to steal it. I'm talking about on a large scale as well as in our own personal lives. Amen. And uh, so as we looked at this, Lord, help me today as I share from the Word that it might bring life to every single person, that we might understand grace in a greater way, that I believe that it is the part of the power to save our nation, to bring us back to God, that when we humble ourselves and begin to pray, there is power. You said you'd heal our nation. I believe it is associated with this power, ultimate power of our God that will cause this nation once again to return to walk in the goodness of our God. And we'll give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there was uh, three guys, that uh, an Englishman, a Norwegian, and a Russian, that were introduced to the story of the Garden of Eden. And so they were asked what they thought and who might actually was Adam and Eve actually English, Norwegian, or Russian. The Englishman said, well, it was an absolutely beautiful, lush garden, beautiful flowers. It could have only been been an English family. They're the only ones that know how to build that kind of garden. The Norwegian said, well, they were naked and unashamed, so they had to be Norwegian. (laughs) I thought that would go good in here. And the Russian said, no, 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 you're all wrong. They had no clothes. They had no house. They only had one apple between them. And they were told that they were in paradise. They had to be Russian. (laughs) Three men were in the coffee house, and they were reading newspapers. One man just looked at his newspaper and just shook his head. Third man looked at the other man, and he reading his newspaper, and he just shook his red head. The third man said, you know what? If you guys are going to discuss politics, I'm going to leave. (laughs) No matter who you vote for, it seems that the government always seems to get in. Okay. I thought it was good. There are three kinds of lies. Small, big, and politics. Okay, and... uh, No, I'm not going to read that one. Okay, so... You all okay this morning? So we've done... Actually, this is the uh, fifth part, fourth part this, this week, dealing with just looking at how grace crucifies religion. In part one, we really talked about grace... It really spoke to the adulteress caught in the act of adultery where it was according to the law to be stoned to death, but Jesus, full of grace and truth, chose not to condemn, but rather to speak. Grace spoke to her, go and don't do that again. In other words, it's the picture that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and relieves us of the pressure of condemnation that the enemy wants us to live in because if he can get you to feel condemned, you cannot receive the promises of God because the law will always produce condemnation because you cannot live up to the fullness of the law. Amen. The law causes us to be sin conscious and not grace or faith conscious. Part two, we talked about when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he took the curse of the human regulations. 
He took them to the cross and he nailed them there that they were not to come back on humanity. Yet nonetheless, just talking to someone again last night about uh, uh, back at a, at a church that she was visiting from her youth and her grandmother had passed away and she was just talking about li- listening to how it was operated. No women in the pulpit. In fact, she had to get per- special permission to speak from the pulpit over her grandmother's funeral. This is still prominent in the world today. This sort of foolishness that has eliminated 50% of the body of Christ from ministry because saying women can't minister. But my Bible says there is no difference male or female in the spirit. Come on. But for some reason, religion has taken such a grip and has such a grip on people's lives, it constantly is stealing their freedom. Anything that steals your freedom of accountability and responsibility, you could call religion. In some cases, you could call our government religious. We are almost um, amen on that. I'm not politically correct. (laughs) amen part three we talked about grace and really what grace restored in other words when Jesus took that to the cross what really transpired for you and I it restored our spiritual consciousness that we could once again develop a personal relationship with God because under law it is very difficult to have a relationship with where you believe your God is about to harm you, send you to the hospital because you didn't behave well, or you can't be blessed because you didn't quite measure up. When you have that kind of relationship, you do not have a relationship. Amen. And so when you look at this, he restored us to a place where we could have a loving relationship with our Father God because we believe he's good and he's got good in store and he's got a great plan for our life and he desires for us to be healed and he desires for us to be blessed and he desires the very best for us here on this earth as well as eternity. Why would he want to make us miserable here so we'd really enjoy there? No, he wanted us to be so blessed here, we'd be so excited about getting there. Oh, come on, somebody get it. He restored the gift of discernment. When the discernment gift of the Holy Spirit has been restored to us because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we might know what is right and what is wrong. Our hearts will tell us, don't go there. (coughs) Don't do that. Our heart, that's the power of grace, that work within us that you can discern. You can discern who to hang out with. Amen. You got to love them all, but you might have to love some at a distance. Amen. It restores the power of reason. Oh, glory to God. I gave you an example of that a few weeks ago, but how about this one? If guns kill people, then spirit. Spoons make you fat. And I think we should outlaw spoons. I could solve a lot of... Okay. Talk about reason. Lord, Jesus, help us. Restore the breath of life from the Word of God. Again, that would come back to the value of the local church where we hear the Word of God go forth and it's impacted. It, it is to bring us life. He did, he, and so often I think sometimes from the pulpit you hear things that bring death. You have to bring life. The Word brings life. It is life. It is the way, the truth, and the And the Word of God should have that effect, and the Holy Spirit should take that and bring life to you, that our God desires the best life for every one of us. And grace has that power once you really grasp it. Get enough of the religion out. Somebody help me. Restore the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and not by the law. 
Oh, it's quiet. This is what Jesus did for us. He restored the value of human life. I didn't think he heard me. His death, burial, and resurrection should have brought the power and the real realization of the value of life. Amen. Amen. His life given for many. What kind of value does God place on life when he would allow his son to die for all of your lives? Come on. That your life might get good and heavy and be blessed and get out of the law and get into the goodness of our God. Wow, that's what an awesome, awesome God. His mercy and his grace endures forever in the midst of our weakness and our failings and not measuring up. He still loves us right in the midst of it. Amen? Wow. I get, I get excited about this. What did we really gain then when we just look at this? Let me read this statement to you. So because of the death, burial, and resurrection of grace and truth, we can now walk in the light with full power and full authority has been granted back to us. I said we have full power and full authority to be able to change our tomorrows, to utilize faith, to make life better day by day. The best way to manage your future is created. He gave us the power and the authority to actually do that. Are we using it like we should? To gain life and revelation from the word. Able to discern good and evil and be reasonable. <coughs> the breath of life. To be led by the Holy Spirit to truth and the way and the life. Because we have been justified, fully purchased, completely <coughs> made overcomers, and personally qualified to do good. <coughs> I think I got too excited this morning. Could I have a drop, one of those, bring one up? So today, we're finally going to start the sermon. <coughs> now, I've taken you on a process because you know that I believe that perceptions are formed by an ounce of information, and they're changed by a ton. And so I feel like I've had to cover this gradually, slowly, to be able to say what I'm about to say. So for the new people, sorry about that. <laughs> We're going to look at some scriptures to really grasp and understand the Ten Commandments, to understand what God wrote on our heart, and what I believe really is how grace will work fully in your life, perhaps even by the time you leave here today. That's a tall tower, uh, tall promise, I guess. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Let's start with that, I think. I told you to turn to Hebrews, but let's change that. I believe yet that whether it was God's intention or not, I'm not saying. I know that God inspired the Ten Commandments. I believe that societies worldwide have been built around the Ten Commandments in their essence and their principles for the unsaved as well as the saved. It has brought some forms of civilization, if we can call it that, perhaps maybe... You could say it has brought certain levels of humanity to the creation. Could we say that? All right. But in Galatians 24, uh, chapter 3, verse 24, let's look at this. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a what? So once this Faith was infused, the faith 
in God is from coming to church and hearing the word, but the faith of God has the power to give us life and life more abundant. So, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So, no, we're no longer just children of God. We're no longer just friends of God, but now we are sons and daughters as full heirs to what Jesus has done. When you become a joint heir, it's because someone died and left an inheritance to you. And we are full sons and daughters in God's sight. And we have every right to every bit of blessing that has been provided because Jesus paid a complete price. Amen. For we are, okay, let's go from there to Hebrews chapter 10. And let's look at verse 16, 17, and 18. Now the law was given to prove that we needed a redeemer. It was given to prove. In other words, it was to help paint this picture that we couldn't do the law effectively. So we needed it to tutor us, to show us that we needed a redeemer. And then in the fullness of time came the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ or the grace or mercy of God reached us at salvation. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. That's the first six days, and now we're in the church age. And the Lord said, I will put my laws, small l, into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Then he added, their sins and their lawless deeds, what? Which ones? Thank you very much. I will, re not only has he forgiven, but he forgot. So there's no recollection, no history of it. He can't go back and be historical. Amen. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is the remission of these, the forgiveness, there is no longer an offering for sin because it has been completely paid for. Some people have translated that to say, if you sinned after you got born again, you're going to hell. Because of misunderstanding the scripture. Is anybody home? People get into loss of salvation and this and that. All kinds of strange things from not understanding the Word of God. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're gonna, this is really long. Hang on. You are, look at this. You are our epistle written in our hearts, knowing and read by all men. In other words, that once... God has written on our hearts something that he's written on our hearts. They will know us. It isn't going to be because you hammered them with the word of God. It isn't going to be because how perfect you are. There's going to be something that flows out of our lives as a power and an energy that influences and affects people, and they will know that we are Christians. I said because... All action and behavior flows out of the content of the heart. Why did God write it on the heart? Because he knew that this would produce the right behavior. And people would understand and know we're Christians just because of his power and his grace. All right, I'm, I'm taking you somewhere, so just stay with me. Clearly, you are the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is our heart. Okay. Now, they come out of Egypt blessed in grace, not deserving, saved by the blood. They left wealthy, and healthy. 
on their way. They said, could you please give us some rules to live by because we think we can live by those rules. We, we need some boundaries. Were there any boundaries as they traveled? They were grumbling, complaining. We should have stayed. Pharaoh's going to kill us. Oh, it opened up. Red Sea, oh, a miracle. Oh, got to the other side. Oh, we don't have enough food. We should, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's too loud. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Probably not the spirit. And so everything is perfect. God's just blessing his mercy and his grace is covering them. They have them. Foods, everything's provided. Shade. I mean, it's awesome. Wonderful life. My gosh. Then they decided, we think we can. So Moses goes up, and he gets the Ten Commandments. They're chiseled in stone. As soon as he comes down, we know, we talk about the glow and the veil, but how many know that the veil has been removed? See, the veil was the picture that the grace and the power of God had been covered. They could not look on his, come on somebody. But Jesus rent the veil from top to bottom so that we might go into this thing called grace. But it was hidden from them and all they saw was the tablet of stones. And when they looked at the Ten Commandments. They suddenly became sin conscious. Do I have one other God? Have I really honored my parents like I should? Did I cheat on my taxes? Is there many home? Have I caused someone else with my mouth to to change their life or affect them in a negative. And suddenly, they became sin conscious. When they became sin conscious, 3,000 died. When grace was presented, because there was 120 in the upper room that simply agreed in the power of what Jesus had done, 3,000 were saved. 3,000 were saved. What? They were saved by grace. They were destroyed by the law. Is anybody following this? This is powerful when you start. We have such trust through Christ towards God. I'm going to have them skip the rest of those, and I, I encourage you to read 2 through 14. They're really awesome. I need to move on quickly. Go to Mark 12. Or, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. See, the law takes you to what you can do. Grace takes you to what Jesus has done. Okay, let's go to Mark. 1230. Well, he's fast back there. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first, come on somebody, commandment. commandment. Wow, this is pretty interesting. Go to John 13, 34. Wait a minute. Here, here, it, here it is. Now watch this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you, the, you also love one another. Right. Somebody, are you hearing that? Yes. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Yep. Is that right? Heard this a few thousand times, all right? Taking you somewhere. Go to Romans 5, 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been, help me somebody, poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. He's, so what has God written on your heart? He did not write the Ten Commandments on your heart. 
he wrote his love on our hearts. Because when his love is in operation, a love that never fails, it is immediately concerned more about others than yourself. Are, then you don't do things that harms your neighbor. You don't say things that are destructive. You don't do things that hurt the heart of God. All he had to do was write his love on our hearts. If we were... When you received the grace of God, you received the ultimate power of his love because he knew your love can't do it. And it's getting in touch with his love in your heart that's able to love and not carry unforgiveness. It's able to love and not judge. It's able to love and not carry offense. It's able to love in all circumstance, whether they smell good, look good. Come on, somebody. When this love is an operation, and it is in you, it just needs to be uncovered, and the law has to be eradicated because the law has kept you hooked to your love and what you can do. Uh, as I'm dealing with this in training, it is fascinating the depth of what happened. Next, don't, don't miss the next one. Oh, my. I wanted to preach it today. But you're going to have to wait because I ran out of time anyway. But it, it's like whenever you say, I can, you are in trouble in the kingdom of God. Because you just took your will and moved it from God's will to yours. But on the other hand, we know that we've been trained not to say, I can't. Come on, somebody. But the Bible says, I can do all things except by. I can do all things through Christ. Come on, whose strength is, come on. So when I realize that it is God, I can, but I can't. But he can. Whew, it, we got to get that out of our mentality and into his. Then you're walking by his will and by his spirit. If you got anything out of that, give the Lord a hand clap. I'm going to quit. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you for the word of God. Let it be written on our hearts, the things that are true and those things that are not true be washed away in the precious blood of Christ. And we'll give you praise and glory. And most of all, I really want, just pray this prayer with all of you today. I believe it so strongly, so with my whole heart that I, I understand this God love because I'm, as slandered as much as anybody, or attack as much as anybody, probably more than most. But I'm able to love those and bless them. I don't think you heard me. Not be offended. Not walk in unforgiveness. Is anybody home? But it's only the love of God that can do that, because my love would want to take them out. Is anybody home? Yeah. But with God's love, you're able to just love them and understand that they don't understand and they don't even know. As Jesus said on the cross, they don't know what they're doing. That was how he, that's how grace approached it. They don't really know what they're doing. Forgive them. Are you, are you getting this? This is a good part of the sermon then God's love is an operation. So powerful. So powerful. And you begin to live in peace. And you begin to live in joy. It can't be stolen from you. 
You can really live in the promises of God. Health, wealth, joy, peace, and highly favored. Receive his love today by an act of your will. Saying, Lord, I'm going to let go of my love, and I want your love to work in my life from this point on. So that I might truly receive full understanding of grace. And be able to love past all circumstances and all situations. And we'll give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never received Christ, I'm going to pray this prayer. Everyone pray aloud. Just repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you really grasp the idea of the love of God. Because once you grasp the love of God, not your love, but God's love, it has such overcoming power from all circumstance, all attacks, all situations. It truly makes us an overcomer and more than a conqueror. Thanks for tuning in. We count you as part of Living Word. Love having you be part of streaming. Please continue. I'll be back again next week with more word. God bless you. Amen.